Good morning. We're all kind of gathering in. I know there's a lot of activity. Okay, it's working now. <laughs> We'll get everybody to come in. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath to you. It's uh, great to be in God's house this morning. Um, just have a couple of quick announcements for you. If you're visiting with us, I want to just welcome you to the Scottsdale Thunderbird Church um, and pray that you will be richly blessed by worshiping with us this morning. A um, couple of quick announcements for both our regular members and visitors who are always here. Um, in the front of the bullets, in the front of the church, there is this little slip of paper. We're trying to put a digital um, directory together, so make sure that uh, you put your name on it uh, and some of your information. Just fill it out and give it to us. I think that's something that would be uh, greatly helpful for us as we try to outreach uh, to one another and just keep in touch. Um, so uh, make sure that you fill one out uh, for that. Uh, another uh, announcement is um, we have, I think it's Chloe's birthday tomorrow. I think she's turning one. So I think that's going to be a great celebration. So we're uh, happy for her. So if you can make it, uh, we welcome you to come out. Um, and then uh, today at 6.30, um, there is going to be a basketball game with some folks from uh, New Zealand and I think our JV and uh, senior team. Uh, so they're going to be performing a, is it Haka, right? Haka. So I, I've seen it online. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it's kind of like this war dance and they, you know, they, they, I'm not going to do it in front of you, but uh, I, I could, but I'm not. And um, uh, but it, it'll be something to see. So if you never experience uh, something like this culturally, it's a, it's a very different thing. So uh, it, it would be encouraged for you to come out to, to, to do that. So a lot of things that are happening. Um, also, just kind of um, put your attention to the bulletin uh, for um, some of the other things that are happening. I know there's um, T TAA and TCE Christmas concerts. All those things are coming up. So just look at your bulletin for that. Um, and then always remind you that usually at the beginning of the year, um, in January 4th, we're going to have our agape uh, feast. It's kind of a great uh, time to kind of just a great way to start the year. I, I always look forward to it, just to enjoy the fellowship with one another. Um, we, you know, do our foot washing, but also just have a great spread and food and just fellowship and eat with one another. So I, I invite you to kind of mark your calendars for that. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask you to please just kind of stand and kind of greet one another and welcome each other to church. Uh, story this morning, so I think Leo's going to come up and uh, give us a, a message. But before he comes up, I'll just kind of like to read something from you from Psalm 57, just as we get into a, 
Um, it says, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make a melody. Awake my glory, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love in is great in the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Good morning. I want to let you know that this is an international church today. We have people from Canada, from Jamaica, and probably some other areas too. So we're glad to have you here. We're <laughs> glad to see all of our visitors. I want to bring you just an introduction to a DVD we're having. This is our major mission program here in Arizona, is our Good News TV. Good News TV has six outlets, and we cover 90% of the state. And uh, it uh, is something that uh, costs money. But I wanted to let you know what we've been doing. We spent the majority of the last year moving three of our stations to new channels as a part of a nationwide FCC requirement. You, our viewers and supporters, came through to help us and we're excited to report that these moves will result in significantly increasing and reaching more viewers in each of these areas. There is a fourth and final move still in progress, which is impacting many of our Phoenix area viewers right now. Please make this a matter of your daily prayers, as we don't want to lose any of our viewers. And most of the other moves that we've made, we've gained hundreds of thousands of viewers. So we're very glad that we were able to make those moves. Some of them cost money, some of them didn't. But uh, I wanted to give you the end result of what happens as a result of our Good News TV. I have a DVD of a lady from Yuma that recently <laughs> recently came into the church, and uh, I think you'll enjoy that. Uh, Yuma, by the way, has only been on about two years. Uh, they have 10, uh, maybe even 12 now, uh, new members that have come in through Good News TV and the church at Yuma. So I hope that you enjoy this uh, six-minute uh, DVD. I was home by myself after I had the satellite cut off. And I figured I would, didn't need satellite anymore because I really didn't watch it, it watched me. And my husband was in Jamaica, he's a Jamaican, and he had been gone for a week already. And I was watching TV and I was just sitting on the bed every day because it was summer and uh, kids are out of school. I had nothing to do, I'm a teacher. And I would just sit there and watch uh, 3 ABN uh, Good News TV. And it was a choice between Good News TV and Channel 19. And most of the time, I liked Good News TV because it had lots of information. And I was sitting there and I actually tuned in to hear what they were saying. You can watch TV all the time and not really understand what they're saying. And I was just sitting there and I was like, I've never heard this before. They were actually preaching out of the Bible. I've always been to church. I've moved over the years. 
and I, I've never heard a lot of the things that was being said. So I just sat there and I was watching Doug Batchelor and he's a soft-spoken sort of guy. And usually you don't really pay attention to soft-spoken people. It goes in in one ear and comes out the other. But I was totally amazed. He was talking about going to church. How do you pick a church? And it occurred to me that the church that I was going to at the time, the way I picked it, other than going with my girlfriend from, from school, was because I liked the music. I didn't understand the preacher at all because he taught like it was a Bible school and you flip here and you flip there and I felt so out of it. But when they sung, I was okay with that. And then I started going, you know, I'm not going, I'm not going to church anymore. So I stopped going and I would just watch Good News TV and I was perfectly happy with that. And then one day, Doug Baxter said at the end of his program, he goes, you need to find a church near you. I go, hmm, okay. I looked around and I didn't have a telephone book. So I got on my phone and got on the internet. And behold, Huma Central came up. Ha, ah, there we go. And the first one comes up is Huma Central. So I came down. And the first time I came in, I was greeted like I've been here before. Like I've been here many a times. They were so happy to see me. I am so happy. These people don't know me. They don't know I'm lonely. It was just so much fun. And when my husband came back, I said, honey, I made a decision. He says, what is it? I go, I go to church on Saturday now. Are you okay with that? He goes, sure. Will you go? I go. So he started coming with me and we went to Human Central for a year and then we decided to get baptized. This was my second baptism and it was his first. And it was, it was marvelous. It, it was even better than I've ever been baptized. And, and I've, I don't miss church. I don't miss Sabbath school. I don't miss Bible study. And I don't miss Good News TV. I watch it every day. Every day it's part of my life. And I feel like without it, which it has happened, that something's missing. I feel closer to God. I didn't know that the Trinity was Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost. That wasn't taught in my church. Of course, I'm not Catholic, though I probably would have known that. And I didn't know Jesus was God. I didn't, it, it's, it amazed me with all the years that I've been to church, that the things that I've learned in the last two years have kept me on the straight and narrow. And I think the Lord put me in Arizona to slow me down. I went from Cuba to White River, which is an Indian reservation, to Parker, which is another Indian reservation, to Yuma. And I found in my life I haven't missed anything. I've gotten better. My husband is happy. I am overjoyed. My life is great. I don't worry about anything, no finances, because I feel if you take care of God, He'll take care of you. When people need things, I might have to wait a while to get the new phone I want, but I give to them because Jesus would have done it. So. I'm totally happy. So, I feel like if you're missing something in life, you're probably missing the Lord. Watch Good News TV. It'll touch your heart.
Yes, that one. All right, let's stand for our opening hymn, please. Isn't it great we can sing Christmas songs now and not be embarrassed about it? I started back in June, but here we are. Praise God. It's the season for it. come before your throne of grace this morning with happy hearts to be in your presence, knowing that we will be blessed because we have been here. We ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit to be sent down, to be poured out among your people today, that we might receive the richest blessings that you have in store for us. Thank you, Lord, for all you do for us, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If we can get all the children to pick up your offering, Mark will have a children's story for us. Thanks. Come grab a basket.
many of you ate breakfast this morning? Looks like about everybody did. Well, that's good because they, you know, they say that's the most important meal of the day, right? Breakfast is my favorite meal. Actually, I, if I had breakfast for lunch and dinner as well, I'd be happy because I like breakfast. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story about when I was in high school, and my little sister and I had a little bit of an issue, and this issue basically arose around a breakfast food. Any of you guys like Pop-Tarts? Raise your hand if you like Pop-Tarts. Probably not the most healthy option for breakfast, but you know, in moderation, right? You know, Pop-Tarts aren't that bad. Well, my mom used to do all the grocery shopping on Saturday, and uh, she, would, she would go to the grocery store, and uh, she would get all the groceries, and she would come back. And when she got back, my little sister and I would rush out of the house so we could help her unload the groceries. Not necessarily because we wanted to be helpful, but more for the reason that we wanted to know what we had in stock, right? We wanted to know what was being put into the cabinets and the refrigerator and where. So when we got home from school and we raided the cabinets, we would know what there was. Where where'd she put the chips and the ice cream and all that cool fun stuff that we really weren't probably supposed to eat without permission, but we did anyway. Shame on us, right? Well, one of these uh, um, favorite foods that we had were Pop-Tarts, and we always knew where they were. And uh, my sister and I had a different philosophy when it came to eating these types of foods. Her philosophy was, if we had the good food, we should eat, ration it out through the week, and you know, eat a little bit on Monday, a little bit on Tuesday, a little bit on Wednesday, so on and so forth, so the food would last longer. Um, I had more of a wolf mentality, where I thought, why not just eat it all at once, and then, you know, be done with it, right? Well, so we had a little bit of an argument when it came to how the food should be distributed. Well, several weeks had gone by, and my mom had bought, and bought a box of Pop-Tarts, and if I remember right, I think it was the bonus box, right? So not just three packages, but four, and you know, there's two in each package. That's, that's eight Pop-Tarts, okay? So eight Pop-Tarts were in that box. And uh, we would uh, unload the groceries, and then by the time, you know, two or three days into the week, the Pop-Tarts were gone because someone ate them all. Who do you suppose that someone was? Yeah, it was me. I ate all the Pop-Tarts. Well, my little sister became very frustrated because, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday came around, and she thought, well, it'd be nice to have a Pop-Tart. And she went, and there were none left. And so she discussed this problem with me, and uh, I shared that, well, I'm sorry, I ate them all already. Well, one week she decided she was going to outsmart me, so as we were helping unload the groceries, she grabbed the Pop-Tarts, and she put them away, I put that in quotes because she, she wanted me to think she put them away, but really she hid them. And so the next day came and I thought, well, it's time to eat a box of Pop-Tarts. And so I went to the cabinet and the Pop-Tarts weren't there. And I thought, now I know my little sister wouldn't have eaten all the Pop-Tarts. And I, all of a sudden a little light bulb flashed on above my head and I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to search her room because I know she hid them from me. And I opened her cabinet, and her stack of sweaters looked a little odd. So I lifted up the sweaters, and lo and behold, guess what I found? A box of Pop-Tarts. So I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse this little trick on her. So I ate all the Pop-Tarts, <laughs> and I very carefully closed the box back up and sealed it so it looked like it hadn't been opened and I stuck it back under the sweaters exactly like she had it. Oh, I tell you what, the next day when she went to get the Pop-Tarts out of her room, I could hear a scream, and uh, I started laughing, and then I saw her come out, and she chased me out of the house and tackled me in the yard, and um, it was one of those situations where I was laughing really hard, but it actually kind of hurt when she hit me 10 times or whatever it was. <laughs> um, and we, had a, we now laugh about that, but I had a problem that started with a G. Does anybody know what that problem was? I was being what? Say it loud. Greedy! She said greedy, for those who didn't understand that. 
Yeah, she did say it loud. So I was very greedy. Now, what does the Bible say about people who are greedy? If you look in Proverbs 1, verse 19, it tells us that greed is not a good thing. And I don't have it memorized. I'm sorry. I left my Bible back in my seat. But greedy kind of takes the life out of us. And uh, God created us to be giving, not greedy. And uh, unfortunately, we've kind of flipped that in our sinful ways, and we've become a greedy people. So my challenge for you to this week is when there's something that you really want and you want it all, share it and see if it doesn't make you feel better in the long run, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for being our God, and we thank you that you're not greedy. As a matter of fact, you created all good things for us to experience and share and it gives you pleasure to share it with us. And if we would learn from you and actually share it with those around us, we could experience that pleasure as well. And I pray that you'll be with each one of these young people up here. Help them to uh, be giving and not greedy. And just bless them through this week and guide them in all their ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mark, for that story. I enjoyed it. I know not to invite you over with eat my Pop-Tarts. Today's uh, offering for us is uh, for World Budget NAD Adventist Community Services. So it's not our local community services, but it's our broader community service. Um, I've always made it one of the things um, I enjoy, like, for example, for ADRA, um, they have different programs um, that they help in different parts of the world uh, for the less fortunate. And, and I make it every year, this time of year, to kind of, you know, outline and, and, and give to those um, uh, areas. Um, many of us have come across where we see uh, panhandlers, you know, out on the streets, right? You've, you've seen them, they have the signs. Um, and, you know, you don't know if they're going to spend the money on uh, food or drugs or cigarettes. Um, but there's a story that has been told uh, to kind of restore some of the faith in some of these people. So recently, a pastor had the experience um, with, with, some, uh, some, with a panhandler. And he had been downsizing his life and taking many of the things to a local flea market. And late one uh, afternoon, he was packing up his things. Uh, a couple came by and asked if they could help because they were hungry and needed to find lodging for the night. So they began to recite a litany of hard luck events that had happened to him. And so, well, the pastors had heard many such stories, so he stopped their recital but did let them help. And they did, and they worked very hard. And they carried boxes over to the car and the trailer and even helped him put the tarp and the bungees. And eventually, um, this was a worthy case that he thought. And he gave them a generous sum of money, and he also had prayer with them. You know, as Adventists, um, we truly are blessed uh, with our community services organization uh, that give out. We have one here locally as well on 15th Street in McDowell um, where they give to those that are in need. Um, you know, we have ADRA, disaster response and release programs. Um, and our personnel, people that work in these areas, they're highly trained. They, they, they do that to support uh, the, those missions and support people that are truly in need. So um, just remind you to uh, reach out, especially this time of year, as we think how blessed we have been, how the Lord has blessed us this year. Keep that in mind as you return our tithes and offerings. So I'll ask the deacons uh, to come forward at this time. Let's pray. Father, we come before you giving you thanks for all your blessings, giving you thanks for all the gifts that you have given us. And Lord, we just pray that you would uh, bless the offerings that are returned to you today, our love gifts uh, and returning of our tithes, that you would bless them. Father, we pray for those who can give and those who cannot. Pray that you would multiply um, the gifts that are given so that they can go for the worthy cause of uh, helping relieve uh, the suffering that around this world. We thank you, Lord, that you are a generous God, that you teach us, Lord, how to be generous and loving. Um, be with us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, we're going to sing some songs of praise to get us, prepare us for the message this morning. I'm grateful for the organ because I sing loud, but the organ's always louder. So that allows me to just be as loud as I want without bothering anyone. So thank you, organ and organist.
we now have the Kamanzi family who is going to be bringing us our special music today. Happy Sabbath. Through the course of this week, uh, I was watching TV and I saw that the 41st president of the United States was being laid to rest. And so many good things were said about him. And there's one that spoke to me, actually several that spoke to me, how he loved people, all sorts of people, how he was such a great statesman. And then one of the um, eulogies, how do they call them? Yeah. He said something about a topic that um, was totally unrelated, pretty much. He talked about hate. And he said this, and it really stood out to me. He said, and this is the message that I want to pass across. He says, hate corrodes the vessel of the person carrying it. The song we're going to sing for you is, is about freedom. It's about freedom that we receive from Jesus Christ. And as he, sell, he tells us that his ways are way above our ways, so is the freedom he gives us. It's way beyond we can comprehend. And he says in, um, I want to read this scripture. Says in the, just one second. Yeah, he says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. God bless you. For so long I've searched for life's meaning Enslaved by the world and my guilt Then the door of my prison was opened by for the ransom was paid, I was free. Oh, I am free from the fear of tomorrow. I am free from the guilt of my past. Oh. shackles for a glorious song I am free praise the Lord free at last I am free from the guilt that I carry from the dark Empty life, I'm set free. For when I met Jesus, he made me complete. And he forgot the foolish child used to be. Oh, I'm free from the fear. Of tomorrow, I am free from the guilt of my past. Oh, I traded my shackles for a glorious song. I am free, praise the Lord, free. At last, oh, I am free from the fear of tomorrow. I am free from the guilt of 
my past. Oh, oh I traded my shackles for a glorious song. I am free, praise the Lord, free at last. Oh, I traded my shackles for a glorious song. I am free, praise the Lord, free at last. Our scripture reading this morning will come from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. And it reads, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good morning, good morning. I always feel uh, like my part is in the service is a bit superfluous after being blessed by uh, the music uh, that we've had today. I've just been tremendous. So thank you to all those that have had a part of it. And uh, I've got a Pop-Tart story too, Mark, I'll tell you sometime. Uh, let us uh, pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in our great need and desirous of receiving from you that which we do not have and only you can give. Uh, Lord, we are sinners in need of grace. We are confused in need of direction. We are lost and you know the way. So we come to the way, the truth, and the life this morning and plead for the presence of Jesus uh, that brings every good and perfect gift with him. So thank you for hearing our prayer, for uh, blessing us with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for, for being among us today. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> I just wanted to share a little bit with you. Some of you know, and I've, I've talked to some of you about... Uh, uh, what I did last week, I went with, uh, how'd you figure out how that worked? It's not going. <laughs> it's not going. So uh, I went last week up to uh, uh, Paradise, California. How many of you have friends or family in the Paradise area? Yeah, some of you do. Um, I was able to uh, go with uh, Pastor Eric Vandenberg. Some of you remember uh, Pastor Eric. And we went up on uh, on Monday and uh, worked there for a week. Um, most of you know uh, the Paradise uh, uh, Camp Fire. It wasn't a campfire. It was called the Camp Fire, <laughs> and uh, it kind of swept through the uh, through the little town there. Um, started early in the morning, um, or probably around 7:30, and they think that it was probably some electrical lines that were sparking uh, because they had a high winds, 40, 50 mile an hour winds, and uh, the the uh, sparks got into the grass, it was very dry there, and uh, just uh, took off, and fueled by that uh, that wind, uh, just swept over the, uh, the little town there, and the surrounding areas. Um, you can't really see on, on that uh, little map, but it says there's a, there's a time frame up, up at the top, 
and the fire started uh, down in the, the blue area, down by the highway on the left, and by 10 o'clock in the morning, it was already, uh, it started around 7.30, and by 10 o'clock, it had, it had followed the blue area across, and by 8 p.m. that evening, uh, most of the town was in flames, and uh, some of you have heard the stories of, of people trying to escape, the, the roads being clogged, and uh, <clears throat> if you get a chance, uh, go and listen to uh, Pastor Steve Hamilton uh, tell the story of his escape. Pastor Steve Hamilton was the youth director for the Rocky Mountain Conference for the last six years. And about two months ago, uh, two and a half to three months ago, he took a call. He decided he wanted to get back into pastoring. And so he went to the, uh, the Paradise Seventh-day Adventist Church in Paradise, California. Uh, rented a home there. And uh, Pastor Steve uh, is, uh, some of you might have gone to Yavapines when Pastor Steve came and helped Eric out there. He's into off-roading and, and, and climb, climbing. He builds rock crawlers and, uh, and enjoys teaching kids all about the joys of off-roading. Well, he had been in paradise for three weeks uh, when, the, when the fire came over and he lost his home. Uh, as the pastor of the church there. The assistant pastor lost his home. The treasurer lost her home. The church clerk lost her home. Um, many people lost their homes. They uh, one, I think one church member uh, perished in the flames. Um, and uh, the hospital, the Adventist hospital that is there, uh, about 40% of the, I think 30 to 40% of the hospital was burned. The academy, Paradise Academy, Adventist Academy was burned to the ground. Uh, Paradise Church was burned to the ground. Uh, 1,200 member church, large church, beautiful church. Uh, part of the grade school was burned to the ground. Many businesses, um, I think about 7,000 homes and 52,000 people were displaced. But uh, um, Pastor Steve talks about uh, uh, many people were, were sitting down to eat breakfast and no warning, no, no uh, alarms went off. They just looked outside and noticed that, oh, oh, honey, the trees on, outside are on fire. <laughs> uh, and at that point, uh, if you've lived in a forested area, you know it's time to get out and get out in a hurry. And so people rushed to their cars. Uh, one man, I heard the story, went around. He lived in a retirement neighborhood. Many people retired. Lots of Adventist pastors there retired. All the Adventist pastors, retired Adventist pastors, lost their homes. Every one. <laughs> so uh, I, I, that, that is... Uh, a warning to me to never retire. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so anyway, paradise turned into uh, the opposite of paradise, if you know what I'm talking about. That, that people tried to, uh, to escape, and uh, the roads were clogged. People ended up having to jump out of their cars and run uh, to, uh, for their lives, and their shoes melting to the pavement, uh, their cars burning. Uh, many, many of the people that died, I think they, the, the count is up to about uh, 90 or so folks that, that lost their lives. Many of them were in their cars trying to escape. Um, uh, you can see whole neighborhoods. This is a, a retirement communities. The fire was pretty merc merciless. It, uh, it, it devoured, uh, going a little too fast there, brother. <laughs> devoured homes and uh, mobile homes and, and beautiful homes alike. Uh, many people displaced uh, outside of the Walmart was a, a tent city, uh, pretty much. And uh, when we when we flew in on on Monday, it was a beautiful day Monday morning. But by Monday evening, the rain it started raining, and by Tuesday, the winds were howling again. And and if you can imagine living in a tent with 40, 50 mile an hour winds and rain, uh, it was uh, it was incredibly miserable. And uh, uh, so we, we uh, spent a lot of time there. A lot of people had donated RVs, um, and they, they said, here, just take, take my camper. I'm not using it. Take my fifth wheel. Take... And uh, so there was a physician uh, there, uh, not a physician, but an optometrist that had a, a large parcel of land, and the fire had literally burned up to his fence line and stopped there. And he was so grateful uh, to the Lord that uh, he asked if, uh, you know, what can, what can we do to help? And uh, so they, they had a, a, a barn and a well, and so he brought in a lot of gravel and poured a, poured a circular road, 
and they took all of these donated RVs and they just lined them up there. And uh, uh, part of what Pastor uh, Vandenberg and another pastor and myself uh, did was to uh, uh, put in septic lines and water lines and uh, got generators and got everybody hooked up. We built porches uh, for, for the people because it was uh, pretty muddy. And, uh, and so we did that all out in this pasture that used to be a pasture, but then it became the, became the mobile home park and, and people that were displaced came and, and had a place to stay. Uh, we set up a, a big kitchen, uh, inside of a large army tent. Uh, uh, the U.S. Army had donated, uh, 200 large tents. And, uh, and so they, they had set up uh, four or five of those out there. And so we set up one as a kitchen. We put tables and chairs and, and sink and a, a little cooking area and some shelves. And the wind was actually blowing so hard while we were setting that up that, that I got, clo- I got too close to the side of the tent. The tent blew out and then it came back and, and literally knocked me across the room, knocked our shelf over. Uh, but those tents, the U.S. Army, they know how to make tents, brother. So, uh, uh, the tent did not fall down. <laughs> Uh, uh, when we arrived, uh, the whole Paradise Church and Academy and the school had moved down to the Chico Church. How many of you are familiar with Chico, California? Beautiful area. It's another large Adventist church with its own academy and gym. And they just opened their arms uh, to the Paradise School and Church and they said, come take over. And, and so, uh, the, uh, the, the past, the, the principal of the school there, his name is Monty Nystrom. Some of you might, might know the, uh, some of the Nystrom family. Um, uh, Monty was the principal, is the principal, and he moved his, his principal's office, became the, was the, the greeter and deacon's room at, at the Chico Church. <laughs> and, uh, somebody had donated a large number of backpacks with, uh, school supplies and things like that for all the kids, and so, the first thing that we did when we got there was we unpacked all of those backpacks and we stuffed them with pencils and, and paper and, and uh, toothbrushes and toothpaste and all those things that, uh, that uh, uh, kids need. And it was real gratifying to see uh, large groups of kids walking around with the backpacks that, that we had done. Uh, go ahead and go to the next one. Now the, the kindergartners, of course, got the colored backpacks the the the, the uh, fancy backpacks and they also got little penguin hats so I thought uh, you needed to see the penguin hats that the Paradise uh, Kindergarten kids are all wearing around so um, here's a picture of our uh, mobile home park uh, the gravel of course is freshly laid we brought out uh, had porta potties brought out uh, so that it wouldn't overload the the system and and uh, here's a, I think the next one is a picture of us. Uh, uh, some of you know Dr. Uh, Joylo Barbosa. He's the smiling guy in the middle. Uh, he was our member here for a while, now lives in Lake Havasu. And uh, Eric on the left and, and yours truly on the right, uh, uh, hooking up the water line. We put in a, uh, a pressure gauge uh, in the water line so it wouldn't blow out all the, uh, um, the RV uh, hoses. So... And it's amazing how much better it is when you actually put the pressure line back in the right way. So we had to take it off and turn it around. And, and so that's kind of why we have the dumb, dumb grins on our faces because we kind of made a mistake there. Uh, you can see uh, here's the field and, and uh, of course the mountain is burned. And to the right is the, is the, the house of the, uh, the optometrist that owned all this property right here. Um, next slide is... Uh, is a picture of the inside of the of the army tent there, all the tables and chairs, and in the back of the of the tent is the uh, uh, kitchen area that we set up and some shelves and so forth. And people were donating food and clothes, and and it became kind of a center of uh, a donation center that that people could could uh, make use of when they needed things. Um, it was also very rainy and and cold. And the mud was just unbelievably sticky. So we went to uh, Home Depot and they were kind enough to uh, uh, give us a bunch of pallets and donated probably two, three thousand dollars worth of wood. And uh, so we laid down the pallets and we just screwed uh, two by sixes in top of the pallets to make a uh, uh, makeshift porch uh, to help people to stay out of the mud and keep their keep their RVs a little bit cleaner. And uh, so there, there was 50 of those porches that that we put together, and in the back you you can see uh, uh, the sewer line uh, that we uh, put in being laid. Uh, this is a, a shower trailer. 
um, is, which is pretty interesting. If you've ever been to a Pathfinder camporee, you know what a shower trailer is. That's a, um, but uh, it's a trailer that has four separate showers. And we hook that up, and uh, those big propane paint tanks uh, uh, hold about, uh, I think they're 60-gallon tanks. And we got three of those. We set up a, a light post outside and, and wired that up so that the, uh, the people could have light um, because it's pretty much dark over there by, you know, 5, 5.30 this time of year. And uh, so we installed that and uh, got it ready to go. Um, ran into this couple. They recognized me. Uh, I didn't recognize them because the last time I had seen them, they were not grown up yet. Um, this this is Tom, um, Tom Maycomer's kids. Some of you know Tom. He's an attorney from the Paradise Valley Church, Tom and, and Shelley. And these are this is Tom's kids, uh, Forrest, uh, we call him Rory, and Maddie, their brother and sister. And uh, Maddie had been teaching at the Paradise School for three years, and uh, her brother, Rory, uh, she said, hey, come teach at the school. It's really cool. You can live with me. And so uh, Rory had just come and started teaching at the Paradise Academy as well, teaching the scientists, uh, sciences there, and, uh, and they were one of the, the ones that, that lost their homes. Most of the staff, I think all of the staff at the, at the Academy lost their homes. Um, but do you notice something about what are these people? Do these look like people that have just lost their homes? <laughs> You know, the amazing thing about, uh, about uh, there was a slide a few uh, slides back. Can you go back until I tell you I forgot to talk about that one? Keep going, keep going, keep going. It's, uh, it was inside of a, of a Home Depot. A um, couple more, a couple more. Right there, stop there. Do you know what those are? They're screens. They're sifters. A Home Depot uh, was giving these to people uh, to take up to the ruins of their home so they could shovel through the ashes and sift out uh, and maybe find Grandma's ring or, or their stash of Krugerrands or whatever it might be uh, that, that were buried in the ashes of their homes because there weren't any, I didn't see any homes that were partially burnt. They were all either standing or they were just completely burnt to the ground. Um, the difference between, you know, people that were carrying those around had in, in Home Depot and the, and the difference between them and the people that I saw at the Chico Church was just astounding. People walking around in town, and there were thousands of them, uh, with glum expressions, tears. Um, people at the Chico, people at the Paradise Church at the Chico Church uh, was different. There was a there was hope, there was hope in their in their eyes and joy, and even though they had gone through this incredible thing that they had gone through, and there were tears, there was crying, but there was joy. There was a deep inner joy, and I thought, what a difference! What a difference! What is it that that makes that difference in people's lives? Now you can uh, flip back through. I'd forgotten to talk about that, but. Um, I want us to look at this text here because I believe that this is where we find the difference. And let's read it. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter five, uh, 4 and verses 7 through 11. It says, uh, We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Do you think that's the secret? What is the power of having joy when you lose everything? What power, what's the power of having hope when you ha literally have nothing whatsoever to, to, and you don't know where your next meal is coming? It's very interesting. Uh, uh, the, the Paradise Church was, they were receiving lots of donations and, uh, and, uh, um, it was going into the bank and, 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 but the donations were not being, uh, had, had, were not being distributed. And somebody called and says, hey, I donated this, you know, and, and they said, well, you know, we, uh, it, and they said, well, why don't you just write checks to everybody? And the poor, the poor church treasurer, she said, but because all the checks in the church burned up. We don't even have checks to, to write checks. So there's, there's little, you know, things like that that happen. But what, what, how do people keep the joy in their heart? How do people keep the, the, the hope and the peace 
when everything is gone. Everything is gone. You know, I'm told uh, uh, Pastor Steve didn't have renter's insurance in place yet. <laughs> when the fire came, uh, some of you might have seen his, his, his story. Uh, he had gone to the grocery store or somewhere. He was not at the house. But he heard the news and saw, and saw the fire coming up the hill. And so he called his wife. He has a 12-year-old daughter and a, uh, I think a 10-year-old son. I can't remember uh, exactly. But, he, but he, uh, he, he called his wife and he says, Honey, put, put the kids in one... Put, put, you go get in one Jeep, get the dog, get the kids. And, and uh, have... Uh, I think it's... Uh, I can't remember the, the little girl's name now. And, but she's 12 years old. He said, have her drive the other Jeep. <laughs> so he is driving one Jeep. His wife is driving the other. And the 12-year-old uh, girl is driving the other Jeep. <laughs> Start them young, folks. That's <laughs> Teach them to drive. <laughs> so uh, he said, honey, if the police try to stop you, just keep on going. So, so sure enough that, you know, there was this poor, one poor traffic cop trying to direct all this traffic that's pouring down the hill and, uh, and uh, saw this, this little girl, <laughs> cute little girl driving the Jeep and tried to wave her over and she just kept on going. So um, one of the good stories that came out, Lee and Margie Venden's daughter, some of you know Lee and Margie, uh, their daughter was an employee at the Feather River, Feather River Hospital there. And she was one of the ones that just barely escaped with her life. Had that, that she was actually on the phone with, with Pastor Lee and Margie. And uh, she was crying and, and the flames were all around them. If you've seen any of these things, it's just uh, unbelievable uh, what, the, what these people went to, through. And she had to jump out of her car and literally run for her life uh, while she was on the phone with her parents. What is it that keeps people happy even though... Uh, things are going on around them like that. We are hard pressed on every side, Paul says, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. What are they carrying? What's he carrying around inside of him? Jesus. Carrying Jesus inside of them. Jars of clay. Anybody like jars of clay? <laughs> it's a good band, isn't it? Jars of clay. Uh, some, some of your versions might say earthen vessels. Uh, we have this treasure in jars of clay. Um, we don't use clay jars too much in America here. I, I think we have a little clay... Uh, Thing that we roast garlic in. I love roasted garlic. Got to have my roasted garlic. So sometimes we, we put some garlic in our little clay pot and some little bit of olive oil and some salt and pepper and put that in the oven and roast their garlic. Um, but most of the time we don't use clay uh, pots in America. Um, they're used by a lot of uh, poorer folks around the world. I remember when we were in India uh, doing evangelistic series in India um, the uh, the people would would cook their rice and their chilies and their peanuts, which they had twice a day. That was their meal, in a little uh, clay pot outside of their home. And the uh, uh, you know they told us don't eat the food when you go to out in the villages. Don't don't eat the the food, and because it it, it could make you sick. And so when we went to these this little sh uh, shanty of a house to meet with a, the Bible worker there and we, and we were at this little shanty and they cooked peanuts and rice and chilies and they said, here pastor, share our meal with us. Do you think I ate it? I sure did. And it was delicious. <laughs> but it was cooked in a little clay pot and, but when the clay pot is broken, it's thrown out. Uh, clay is easily broken. Clay pots Clay jars, jars of clay, they're very fragile. They're, they crack easily. They break easily. Um, once they're broken, they're useless and they're thrown out into the dump. At least that's what the world does with people sometimes. You know, people are easily broken. People are fragile. Um, and when people are broken, when you're, when you're broken as an individual, what does the world do with you? Throws you out. 
You're useless. The world admires that which is expensive and beautiful and strong and talented and, and so forth. And if you don't meet that criteria, then you are marginalized as a human being. You're treated like a, a broken clay pot. And I think a lot of people buy into that. A lot of people find their self-worth from what the world thinks is, is worthwhile. But here's the deal. When you're carrying Jesus around inside you, when, when Jesus sees you, He does not see someone who's cracked and someone who's broken and someone who's worthless and someone's to be thrown aside. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't no ma matter what your present is. When Jesus sees you, He sees what you can be in Him. Even a broken, cracked, fragile vessel. When Jesus sees you and I, He sees what we can be in Him. He sees someone that He gave His life to redeem. He sees all that we can be in Him. And He says, if you will let me come into you, then I can make you into something wonderful and beautiful. He offers to live in us. And that's what it means to have this treasure in earthen vessels. We have this treasure, this treasure of Jesus in these fragile, broken, cracked vessels The King and Creator of the universe is willing and eager to live inside of us. And He's the treasure. He is the treasure. We're the earthen vessels. We are the cracked and broken. We are the cast aside. We are the useless until Jesus comes in. He takes these cracked, broken, useless vessels and He pours Himself into us and Jesus is the greatest treasure. We are the jars of clay. You know, people don't usually put their treasures in things that are fragile. People put their treasures in a safe, in a strong, firm, sturdy, solid iron box. If you have, if you have something that you want valuable, do you put it in something that's easily broken? No. You put it in something that is that is uh, strong. You put your, you put your, in a safe. You put a, in a safety deposit box in the bank. Or, or you might, uh, if, if you have a lot of gold, like, like all the pastors do in the conference here, you put it in forced knocks, right? You, if you have a fine house, it might be in a gated community. You don't, you don't, you don't put things that are valuable to you in something that can be easily broken into or, or broken or ruined. You put it in something that's designed to protect what's on the inside of the vessel, right? When you have something valuable, you put it in something that's designed to protect that thing that's valuable. But here's the deal. When Jesus comes into our life, when the Spirit of God enters into a jar of clay, the jar may be cracked, it may be broken, it may be cast aside or useless in the eyes of the world, but when Jesus pours Himself into that cracked and broken vessel, it's what's on the inside of the vessel that protects the outside. It's not what the outside that protects the inside. It's what's on the inside that protects the outside and makes it beautiful and useful. That's the wonderful thing about Jesus. It's the treasure within that protects the fragile vessel without. When Jesus comes into your life, it's like uh, kintsugi. <laughs> Have you ever seen this uh, 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 clay bowl like this in Japan? Um, in the next slide, there's a, something called kintsugi, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it's also known as golden joinery. Um, known as uh, kintsuku or uh, something or another, blah, 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 that I can't say. Golden repair. It's the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with a lacquer dusted or mixed with powdered gold, silver, or platinum. A method similar to, uh, to another technique. 
And the next slide, it tells us uh, kintsugu is the Japanese art of putting broken pottery pieces back together with gold. Can you imagine a clay pot, something that is so useful uh, or so common as to, as to be thrown away if it gets broken, not even bothered to fix it. You take something that's cheap, something that's fragile, and if it gets broken, you repair it with something as precious as, as gold and platinum. I seem to remember, it sounds like a waste, doesn't it? It sounds like an incredible waste. Why would you put gold in, in clay together? Sometimes God values You remember a story about a, a lady that brought in an alabaster box full of expensive perfume? She broke that perfume. She poured it on the feet of Jesus. Wiped it with her hair. She wasted a whole year's salary on the feet of Jesus. Broken pottery pieces back together with gold. Built on the idea that embracing flaws and imper imperfections, you can create an even stronger, more beautiful piece of art. Every break is unique, and instead of repairing an item like new, the 400-year-old technique actually highlights the scars as part of the design. Isn't that amazing? It highlights the scars as part of his design. Anybody here got any scars? <laughs> I know a lot of us have some external scars. Uh, one of my, when I go to the, uh, to the kids... Uh, and do worships. One of the worships that I do is I show them all my scars. Yeah, I got this one from a swing on the back of my head, and and then the one beside it I got from the same swing because I didn't learn the first time. Then I got this one, and I got that. Oh man, Pastor Jay, you got lots of scars. Yeah, manly men, we have scars, right? What about the scars on the inside? Any of you guys got scars on the inside? Every break is unique and instead of repairing an item like you, the 400-year-old technique actually highlights the scars as part of the design. Using this as a metaphor for healing teaches us an important lesson. Sometimes, in the process of repairing things that are broken, we actually create something more unique, beautiful, and resilient. Let me ask you what Jesus does in your life and in mine when He comes in to start His healing in your life, He creates something that is more unique, more resilient, and more beautiful than you could ever imagine being without Him. The treasure inside the vessel remakes the vessel. There's an old song the, the Gaithers used to sing. It goes like this. If there ever were dreams that were lofty and noble, noble, they were my dreams from the start. And the hopes for life's best were the hopes that I harbored down deep in my heart. But my dreams turned to ashes. My castles all crumbled. My fortune turned to loss. So I wrapped it up in the rags of my life and I laid it at the cross. You know the verse? You know the chorus? Something beautiful. Something good. All my confusion He understood. All I had to offer Him was brokenness and strife. But He made something beautiful out of my life. Because that's what God does with broken people. He makes something beautiful out of your life. If you'll let Him. If you'll let Him. If you're broken today, if you're a jar of clay, if you're a crack pot he'll make something beautiful let Jesus pour himself into your life ask him say Lord I'm broken confess to him tell him tell him Lord I've messed up I'm broken I'm I'm I'm, I'm worthless please pour yourself into my life and make something beautiful and if you do that Brothers and sisters, the promise is that the treasure 
the treasure of Jesus will, will make your jar of clay something beautiful. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Let's pray. Lord, we are broken. We are damaged. We've been cast aside as useless. But Lord, thank you for looking at us and seeing something beautiful. Seeing what we can be with you. Thank you for looking at us through the eyes of the cross. Thank you for, for your precious blood. The Bible says we're not redeemed with, with earthly things like silver or gold, but we're redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for being the thing in us that holds us together when we're falling apart. Lord, bless us. Bless this congregation. Bless each family, each person here. Pour yourself into us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer request or praise report, please come before the throne floor. Hello? Hello? That works. Much better. I was waiting for the music. <laughs> it was kind of weird. <laughs> Sorry. Father God, we come before you, broken vessels, Lord, be before a mighty God who loves us, who fills us with the treasure of Jesus. Lord, there's people before, before you today, Lord, uh, with requests. We're all broken in some way. Lord, we know you can complete us, that you can make us better. I pray for those that have come before here, Lord, um, with struggles that they would bring before you, Lord. I pray for people who have financial difficulties this time of year, illness, lost jobs. Lord, whatever the need may be, you can fill that need. Lord, there's people with broken families, children that have, have left you, Lord drugs, all kinds of all kinds of things, sinful things of this world that have taken us captive in our families and our friends. Lord, we, we just we ask that you heal us, that you heal our families, our friends, our community, Lord. We know that you're coming soon, and we just pray, Lord, that uh, we do as much for you that we can before you come and that we reach as much people for you, Lord. Please just heal our broken hearts. Help us to be vessels shining through your, your grace, your glory, Lord, leading people to Jesus. Lord, we have re, uh, blessings that you've provided this time of year and, and throughout the year. We thank you for those blessings of health and home and, and, and just all the different things that you have provided for our, our every needs, and we thank you for that as well, Father. Please go with each and every one as they leave today. And uh, help us to remember the true reason for the season is Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand for our closing hymn, please.
I didn't see the pot, I saw the gold. That's where my eyes went, right? Is that where your eyes went? That's the way it should be with us, right? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, please come into our lives, Lord. And as the old song says, uh, may people look at us and see only Christ living in us. Lord, what a message we have that Jesus can heal the brokenhearted, that he can put lives back together, that he can make things new again. Uh, Lord, we commit our hearts and our lives to you today, and we thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.